Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church, and he's writing this letter to the Philippian church from prison. He is in prison, but he's not just in any prison. He's not in the county jail, and he's not in the minimum security unit. He is in the praetorium. If you look in verse, I believe it's verse 13, it says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. The uh, Greek word for that that was translated palace is praetorium. So he's not sitting in Caesar's house writing this letter. He's sitting in the praetorium. Now the praetorium, or praetorian rather, is it was a fortress. It was a huge military installation. It was a fortress. Huge walls, huge towers, lots of Roman soldiers, and he is under constant guard. Uh, he, is, he is basically chained to a Roman officer or a Roman soldier at all times. They take turns. They, they, they trade out in shifts. And as he is chained to that Roman soldier, he's witnessing to him. He's preaching the gospel to him. There were also um, other prisoners uh, kept in the Praetorian, but Paul here is in a special situation because he is awaiting his appeal before Caesar. And that's kind of a scary situation when you think about it, to be, because Caesar has absolute power. And so Caesar could very well decide to let Paul go to approve his appeal and let him walk free, and that would be a blessing. He would have no more legal problems after that because the highest authority in the land had set him free. Or Caesar could sentence him to a long prison sentence, and in that case there's no way out of it. There is no higher appeal to make. Caesar could have him executed, and there would be nobody that could, uh, that could overturn that execution. And one of the toughest parts about this is that this is a long wait. You know, when you're waiting to find out the result of something and, and you never seem to get that answer and you're just waiting for that resolution, you're waiting for that answer, you're waiting for the result. And minutes can turn to hours and hours can turn to days and that's kind of the situation Paul is in here. So it's a troubling time for Paul, but it's a troubling time for the Philippian church. And the Philippian church loved Paul. They supported him in prayer. They supported him financially. They gave him money. They gave him gifts. And Paul wrote to the Philippians that they ministered to him even out of their poverty. So even though the people in the Philippian church didn't have much, what they had they gave to Paul so he could continue his ministry. They loved Paul. And so they're concerned for Paul. And Paul's concerned too, but Paul's not so much concerned about himself as he's concerned for the Philippian church. And so he wrote the letter that we now know as the book of Philippians. And Paul is doing well in this passage. He's in prison. He is awaiting his orders to see if he's going to be turned loose or to see if he's going to be executed or to see if he is going to uh, have to go to prison for a long time. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. But he's okay because he understands that the purpose of his existence is to spread the gospel. And he sees how his current situation, being in prison, is resulting in the spread of the gospel. And so seeing that he's in prison, he is chained to a Roman guard. Now think about that. There's, there's no privacy there. There's no me time. There's no downtime. There's no personal time when you're chained to a Roman soldier. When you go to jail, there's no personal time. There's no private time. We, we think of inmates as sitting around watching TV, and that happens in a lot of facilities, but they're never by themselves. They're never alone. They never have any privacy. The facility is in the corner in front of everybody else. There is no privacy. And so Paul has no me time. He has 
the the basic comforts that you and I take for granted. He doesn't have those at this particular moment. He is under constant guard, constant look, constant watch, but he sees how his current situation and the prospect of him dying, he sees how that benefits the spread of the gospel. And so he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing despite his hard times, despite his suffering, despite his hardships. He's rejoicing because he sees that his purpose in life is being fulfilled, even though it has cost him his freedom and may ultimately and will ultimately cost him his life. We need to be able to see things in this world as Paul saw things in this world. We need to be able to see our purpose, our purpose in life. And there's, there's a, there, there are books out uh, that are trying to help you find your purpose and discover your purpose and fulfill your purpose. And you can read those books. Or I can save you 13 bucks by telling you your purpose is to spread the gospel. Amen. Now, your, your purpose in spreading the gospel is different from Paul's purpose in spreading the gospel. None of us are... Hopefully none of y'all are headed to federal prison and, and the federal appeals court system. I hope you don't wind up in that situation. You're not going to wind up in that situation for preaching the gospel. If you wind up in the prison system in America, it's not for preaching the gospel. It's for doing something else. So our calling is not to spread the gospel by being incarcerated. Our purpose is to spread the gospel. Paul's purpose was to spread the gospel. In Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 16, the, the Lord said to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Lord, Ananias, was not too sure about going and meeting with Paul, who had just, uh, who had just been converted. But the Lord's telling Ananias, it's okay, because he's a chosen vessel. I have selected him, I have called him, and his purpose in life from this point on is to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. He is going to bear the, the Lord's name, the name of Jesus Christ, before the Gentiles, before the, uh, before the Greeks and the Romans and the people that the Jews hated, he's, the barbarians. He is going to take the name of Christ unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he is going to stand before kings. Now, Paul didn't know it at this point, and Ananias didn't understand how it was going to happen. But Paul would eventually bear the name of Christ before kings. He bore the name of Christ before Festus, before Felix, before Agrippa. And then eventually he went on his appeal before Caesar, and he was let go. I don't imagine that Paul spoke to the most powerful man in the world at the time without mentioning Jesus Christ. So he did bear the name of Jesus before kings and before the nation of Israel. Paul ministered to Jews also. Paul went into the Sabbath on the on went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He didn't go in there to meet with Gentiles. He went in there to meet with Jews, and there were a number of Jews who were converted in the synagogues. Paul preached the gospel in the synagogues, and there were those who believed. And a lot of times, that was the first church that would get started in that town would be from Jews who came out of the synagogue and followed Jesus. There were times that Paul went into places and there were already believers there. Where did those believers come from? They came from the day of Pentecost, which we'll study that tonight. Paul's purpose, his ministry, was to bear the name of Jesus Christ before everybody, before the world, before the Gentiles, before the kings, and before the children of Israel. And so that's his purpose, is to spread the gospel. And then you look in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I would ye should understand, brethren, these Philippians were concerned, they were saddened, they were scared for Paul. And Paul's saying, I want you to understand, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He's saying, he, Paul is saying, my purpose is to spread the gospel, is to further the gospel. And I want you to understand that what has happened to me has resulted in the furtherance or the spread of the gospel. Men, I'm not sitting here in this prison cell chained to this Roman officer crying in my, in my soup. I am not sitting here in this prison cell feeling sorry for myself. I am accomplishing my mission. This is not pleasant. I want to get out. I want to come back. I want to see you again. I want to minister to you again. I want to spend time with you. But right now I'm in this prison cell. But I want you to know I'm in this prison cell. I'm perfectly fine because my purpose of carrying out the gospel is being fulfilled. Amen. So despite the pain and hardship that Paul is enduring, he is seeing the gospel spread 
and he is seeing his purpose completed, and this is a happy day for him. Our purpose on this earth is to spread the gospel. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We're to be witnesses unto Christ. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go ye therefore, teach all nations. That wasn't given to the preachers. That, that command was not limited exclusively to the preachers. The preachers are included in the command. We're supposed to be doing this too. I heard a preacher tell me one day, My job is not to do evangelism. My job is to teach you to do evangelism. No, the preacher's job is to do evangelism while he teaches you to do evangelism. All right, to make disciples. Let's say make disciples, because that's what we want to do. We want to lead people to follow Jesus. Yeah. Our ultimate goal is not to get people to say a prayer of repentance or a prayer asking Jesus into their heart. Our goal is to lead somebody to where they become a follower of Jesus Christ, where they become a disciple, where they become a church member, where they learn more about the Bible and more about the Lord, and they grow in their faith. That's what we want to see. We, 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 we get there through evangelism. Evangelism is our first step, but there are more steps beyond evangelism. Once somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, there's more steps in the discipleship process. But our purpose on this earth is to spread the gospel. Our purpose is eternal. The people we reach with the gospel will spend eternity in heaven. Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior will spend eternity in heaven. And so sometimes the things on this earth don't look too good. Sometimes we put out a lot of effort and we don't see a lot of fruit right here, right now. You may see somebody accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, then they don't come to church anymore. They go to somebody else's church. Or they leave town or something happens and you get to thinking, well, maybe I'm wasting my time here. Remember that what we are doing is an eternal thing. And so you may not see a lot of the fruit on this side of heaven, but you're going to see the fruit on the other side of heaven. We've got to see ourselves as having an eternal purpose. We are working toward eternal things. We are laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. What's important is what's going on in heaven and what will go on in heaven, not what goes on in this earth. In high school, everything was built around that Friday night, the Friday night football game, the Friday nights at the movies, whether you had a date Friday night. Now, some of y'all might not have been concerned about those sort of things, but, you know, where I grew up and where I went to school, that's what all the kids worry about. Friday night, who's your boyfriend, who's your girlfriend, what kind of car are you driving, do you get to go to the movies? Oh, and if you got grounded for, from Friday night, that was just tragic. Right. You might as well be locked in prison. And so everything revolved around Friday night. And, you, and I, I remember when I was in school, I had all these grown-ups telling me that you know, these are the best days of your life. That was a lie. Those were not the best days of my life. I can tell you those were not the best days of my life. Jessica wasn't in those days of my life. Neither were my three kids, who I will not name, because I don't want you to think I have a favorite based on the one that I named first. Those are not the best days. The best days of my life are happening right now. And I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll be saying the best days of my life are happening right now and looking back on these days and saying, those were good days, but, you know, they're not the best days of my life. There's, there's going to be a day that the, if Jesus doesn't come back and God doesn't call me home, there's going to be a day that the kids are off doing their ministry somewhere. I'm not saying they're going to be preachers or pastors, but they're going to have a ministry as a child of God. Yeah. And Jessica and I are going to be sitting in that house and we're going to be loading up the car because I'll be retired by that point, and hopefully we'll have enough time to go down to the Enchanted Rock. And I'll be saying those are the best times of my life. Or maybe not. Who knows what God's going to do. But you see, to a teenager, everything is about high school and what's going on in high school and what achievements and what popularity and everything that got going on in high school. And you get up to around when you're 30 years old, and if you've grown up at all, you realize that what happened back in high school, whether you were captain of the cheerleader team or starter on the football team or whether you got to go see Star Wars when it first came out in the theaters, none of that matters. Good memories, maybe, but what matters is what's going on now that you're an adult and whether or not you're able to pay your mortgage and, and raise your kids and everything. And just like that, just like you see now that what was going on in high school was not the most important thing to happen during your life, just like that, when we get to heaven, we're going to realize that the things we did on earth 
a lot of them that we thought we, we were just living and dying by, not really that important. High school was a way to gain an education and gain experience and equip yourself for life as an adult. Your time here on this earth is best spent doing things that will have an eternal significance because those are the things that you're going to take to eternity with you. People you ministered to, people you led to the Lord, things you did for God, ways you served God. Those are where the eternal rewards come from. Our purpose is eternal. Our purpose is not earthly. God's goal for us is not to achieve things or have things on this earth. God's goal for us is not to get elected governor of Texas or to make a lot of money or to have a big house or to have a big car or to have a big bass boat or to, or to become president of the something or the other civic club in Brownwood, Texas. God's goal, he may use those types of things to help us fulfill the goal that he has for us, but that's not our goal. Oftentimes, we as Christians think that our purpose is here on this earth and our purpose is to maximize our potential here on this earth and that's not necessarily the case. We maximize our potential in accomplishing eternal things. The things that we have on this earth will be burnt up. The big house will be burnt up. The Bible says in Second uh, Peter that these things will be uh, melted with a fervent heat. It'll, they'll be dissolved. They'll be done away with. There's, there's not even going to be ruins of it left. It's all going to be done away with and we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. So everything we have on this earth from the house to the car to the computer to the church building to the books will all be burnt up. Yeah. And our accomplishments are going to be forgotten. They're going to be forgotten on this earth before we even get to heaven. I don't think anybody's going to remember in heaven who the, uh, who the president of the local high-up society was. We might not even remember who the governor of Texas was. But our accomplishments on this earth will be forgotten. My grandfather desegregated, he integrated the Dawson Independent School District. Nobody in Dawson, Texas knows who he is. They threw tire irons through his windows, but nobody remembers who he is. He hired the football coach that they named their football stadium after. Nobody knows who my grandfather is, and more and more people don't know who that football coach that the stadium's named after was. They just know that there's a stadium named Ed Mitchell Field. That's, that's all they know. Ed Mitchell was in Dawson for decades teaching kids to play football, basketball, run track, and oddly enough, teaching them Spanish. Um, he, he taught Spanish classes. They, you know, mo most of them that are going to school there now don't know who he is. Our accomplishments here on this earth will be forgotten. My grandfather, he would take these trips, and we would go visit some of the schools that he ran, that he was an administrator for, and he'd go around town, and nobody remembered who he was. And it was kind of, a, it was kind of an eye-opener for him. He was ordained as a deacon some years later, and I noticed that his perspective on things, I quit hearing about the things that he did in the public schools, and I started hearing more and more about what was going on at church. I don't know why the change or the transition. He did a lot of spiritual growth, in his, and, and you know, as I was growing up, and he was on up in years, retirement age, he was still growing spiritually. You never get too old to grow spiritually. But I remember going to Evant, Texas, where he was a school principal, or Dawson, where he de de desegregated the schools, or or Somerville, where he led them during a transition, or Latexa, where he built the high school. He got the bond issue passed and then financed it in such a way and put money in CDs to where they wound up getting that building paid for interest-free. So, uh, Latexo High School. All right, My grandfather's name was on the plaque out by the front door because he was the one that led the effort in building Latexo High School. Nobody in Latexo, Texas knows who he is. Our accomplishments on this earth will be forgotten. God's objective is not for you to make as much money as you can, accomplish as many things as you can, and be the best person you can be on this earth. His goal and objective and purpose for you is to do things of eternal significance, and things of eternal significance involve spreading the gospel. Our purpose is to spread the gospel. So we need to change our way of thinking. Instead of hoping for things on this earth, we need to be pr hoping and praying for heavenly things. We need to be hoping and praying for the coming of Christ. We know that that's coming. We need to be hoping and praying for the salvation of others because that's the only way we'll spend eternity with them. And we need to be hoping, confidently expecting rewards in heaven. We need to, think, we need to change our perspective. We need to be heavenly minded. 
We need to be thinking of things in an eternal standpoint. And so when things are going badly in this life, we don't need to be looking at it as trying to figure out if God's favor is upon us or if God's favor is not upon us. Those were the mistakes that Job's friends made. We need to be looking at it through, okay, we're going through a bad time now. How is this helping spread the gospel? How can my hard times and my sufferings right now help spread the gospel? We need to see our time on this earth as time invested toward heavenly things. Going back to high school, algebra was not a fun class. Science was not a fun class. I still cannot balance a chemical equation. It was not fun. But it was an investment to have a better life as an, as an adult. And your time on this earth needs to be seen as an investment for a good eternity. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All too often Christians equate God's goodness with how good life is on, at this moment. But oftentimes God uses our suffering to help us perform our purpose of spreading the gospel. And it doesn't mean that you fall short. It doesn't mean that you're defective. Therefore God has to make you suffer in order to get you to do right. It just means that sometimes the spread of the gospel will be much more efficient if you go through a hard time. Our time here on earth is an investment into God's kingdom. And when hard times come, we need to be looking for ways that they are furthering God's gospel. That they are furthering his cause, his kingdom. Because our purpose is not to live it up and not to live the good life, but our purpose is to spread the gospel. Amen. And the gospel is spread through hard times. Paul says in verse 12, he says, The things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul is flat out declaring that his suffering in prison is resulting in the spread of the gospel. How is that happening? In verse 13, Paul says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Paul is witnessing to the guards, and this is resulting in the gospel penetrating the innermost sanctum of Rome, the most powerful country on the earth at the moment. The guards are becoming believers. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. He's accomplishing reaching the people that work for Caesar. So the faith is elevating from being just a religion of poor people, impoverished people, slaves, and it's actually reaching the upper echelons of Roman society. How? Because Paul is in prison. Paul wouldn't have been able to knock on the door of the praetorium and say, hey, I want to preach to you all about Jesus. But as a prisoner, all they could do was just sit there and listen to him preach about Jesus. Yeah. So it, took, it wasn't that Paul was suffering because God couldn't get him to accomplish his purpose any other way. It's that Paul was suffering because this is the best way to get Paul's purpose accomplished. The best way for Paul to be able to reach Rome would be for him to be in prison. Paul's dream in life, the thing that he hoped for, the thing that he looked forward to. If you, you know, we all have dreams, right? What's your dream? What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, what do you want to do later on in life? What do you want to do for retirement? And you think of all these different things. I'd like to go traveling. I'd like to see this. I'd like to do that with my life. If you would have asked Paul, he said, I want to preach in Rome. Well, God got him to Rome to preach the gospel. He just took him there as a prisoner. And it worked out to the best benefit of the gospel because he's reaching the upper crust of Roman society with those Roman guards and those centurions and those, uh, those Roman officials. He's preaching the gospel and they're becoming believers. Philippians 1.14 And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul's sufferings are making other preachers more bold to preach the gospel. Now, if you look in verses 15 through 17, you'll see that not all of them are doing it with the right motives, but the gospel is being preached. Now, there are some televangelists that I'm not too, that I'm not too crazy about, and there are a lot of televangelists. They're up there, and they are in it for themselves. They are in it to make the profit. They're living in $80 million mansions and all these other great luxuries, and that's, I think they're, they're going to answer to God for using his name to get rich. But every now and then, one of them will slip up and tell you how to be saved. They'll slip up and preach the gospel. They'll, they'll tell you to repent and believe. And you know what? Hopefully they said it to people who weren't hearing it an awful lot. I can, I can name some, but then I'll just get in trouble, so we'll move on. 
But Paul's sufferings are emboldening other people to preach the gospel. And they're preaching the gospel more boldly. Even if they're not doing it for the right motives, they're still preaching the gospel. Your hard times may result in the spread of the gospel. They may put you in a unique position to share the gospel. If you surrender to the ministry and you become a pastor or you become a missionary, there's going to be hard financial times. You're going to make financial sacrifices. You're going to go a lot of. You're going to go some days and some months without a real salary. It's just you're just living off of the free will gifts of other people. That you know, people just say, "I think I'll give the preacher some money," and you're you're living off of that. And I remember, I remember those days living off of church love offerings and mysterious gifts that would appear in the mailbox. And there were financial hard times. It wasn't easy. If you're a minister, people will take advantage of you. Some people will falsely accuse you. Some people will try to discredit you. But there are still lives that you change, and there's still an eternal value there. Your hard times may put you in a unique position to share the gospel. I'm going to tell you about a friend of mine who had a death in the family, and it was a devastating death in the family, and he was mourning, and he was really hurt. But he was called upon to preach the funeral. And he preached the funeral, and I believe two or three people were saved at that service. Sickness. I know a lady, every time I turn around, she's in the hospital. She's preaching to those doctors and those nurses. Yeah. Those doctors and those nurses, those, nur those hospital nurses, they're working ridiculous hours. Yes. A lot of them don't get to go to church because the, their schedule just pre prevents it. A lot of them aren't driven to go to church. They don't really feel the need to go to church, so they work those, they work those 60, 70-hour weeks. And if they are off on a Sunday morning, they're sleeping because they're tired. You preach to those nurses, you might be preaching to somebody who's not hearing the gospel. That's right. Your sickness may put you in a unique position to share the gospel. Your hard times, like Paul's hard times, encouraged others. Your hard times may encourage others. Others seeing you hold on to your faith may encourage them who are suffering to hold on to their faith. Amen. It makes it real to them. You holding on to your faith during hard times makes your faith more real to others. If you're super Christian when things are good and then you abandon Christ when things go bad... It, it, it wasn't real. That's right. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We quote this verse when things go badly, trying to comfort ourselves. Okay, things are going badly now, but it's all going to work out by the end of the day because God's you know, working all things to my good. But the Bible says all things work together to the good of them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God called you to salvation, didn't he? Did he lead you down a path of roses to get you to the point of salvation? Or did he take you down some dark paths to get your attention for salvation? Now, some of you may have been saved as young children. But he had to take me down some rocky roads to get my attention. So I went through some hard times because that's what it took for God to get my attention and call me to his purpose. He calls you to fulfill his purpose of spreading the gospel. But he may have to lead you through the valley of the shadow of death to put you in a place where you have that opportunity. So when God's working all around you, do not be bitter over the pain in your life. It's not good. It's not fun. We need to lean on each other and encourage each other who are going through these, going through these situations. But God is working his will. It's not for nothing. And when you see God working all around you and he's working through your situation and he's working you through your situation, he's pulling you through your situation, but he's using your situation to reach others, that's something to rejoice about. And we need to rejoice that God's will is being carried out. In verse 18, Paul says, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul is rejoicing that the gospel is being preached. He's suffering, but he's still rejoicing. He is still thankful. Others are unfairly profiting. It, 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 preaching it out of uh, uh, even of envy and strife. But he is still rejoicing because the gospel is being preached. Yes. That preacher on TV may tell you to, if you'll just repent of your sins and believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you'll be saved. Now send me your $20 love offering, and, and he'll get rich doing that. But at least he's telling people how to be saved. And we can at least take that as a comfort. That Okay, this guy's profiting off of the gospel, but at least he's preaching the gospel. Yes. I'm not sending him the $20. No. I'm not even watching the show. No. 
But if you tell somebody how to be saved, there is something to that, and there is something to rejoice about there. He rejoices because he sees the eternal value of what's being done. When you see God working around you, rejoice. He'll reward your obedience, he'll reward your suffering, and he'll reward you in heaven where it counts. Now, he can reward you with a great life now, with the best life now, but the best life now is all going to be burned up. So we don't want it now, do we? We want it in heaven. Nothing you do or suffer for Christ is in vain. Philippians 4.12 says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. He, he knows how to have nothing, and he knows how to have it all. I know, how to, I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. We know how to be abased. We know how to endure sufferings. We know how to use those times of sufferings to spread the gospel. We need to know how to use those times of suffering to spread the gospel. But there are going to be times in life that the Lord lets you abound. We need to know how to be a wise steward of the thing that God blesses us with and how to use what God blesses us with to spread the gospel. Paul told that Philippian church, he says, I know how to abase, how to be abased, and I know how to abound. He goes, I know how to be in total poverty, and I know how to live when life is good. And he allowed his poverty and his imprisonment to be used to spread the gospel in mighty ways. And when Paul abounded, he used his abundance to spread the gospel in mighty ways. And he went on to say that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You look at the context of that. We can do all things. That actually means we can endure all things through Christ, which strengthens us. We have a lot to be thankful for this year. Yeah. The economy has been down. Local manufacturing plants are laying people off. Businesses are shutting down. Money is getting harder to come by, and the money that we do come by is not worth as much as it was a few years ago. They say there's no inflation, but the prices of groceries and gas, well, gasoline's been fluctuating, but the prices of groceries keep going up. The prices of utilities keep going up. The, the, you, you can't use as much water now as you used to be able to use. You have to be concerned because the lake level's going down. Yeah. We, we are having a tough year. But you know what? God has still blessed us. Amen. Because when we leave here, we're going to have food to eat, aren't we? Some of us are going to have good food. Some of us are not going to have good food. It depends on whether or not you're having to eat my cooking. If you're having to eat my cooking, you might want to eat somewhere else because uh, my cooking is not so good. Jessica's cooking, on the other hand, will feed an army and a, a happy army too. But Amen. we're all going to leave here. We're, wherever we go, we're, there's going to be food there. Yes. We're going to have shelter. Yes. We are going to have a place to rest. We're going to have time to rest, and we are going to be able to do so in peace without having to worry about what's about to happen to us. Yeah. We don't have to worry about bombs going off in Brownwood, Texas. We, we don't have to worry about an invading army. We don't have to worry about secret police knocking down our door. We don't have to worry about diseases, uh, horrible diseases, floating around in the air around us. We've really got a good life here. Yeah. We've got things to be thankful for. And so when God allows us to have to do without those blessings on occasion, we need to be willing to see how God is working yes. through that. And if we can't see how God is working through that, sometimes he doesn't show us the big picture. He didn't show Job the big picture. We just need to have the faith to know that God is working yes. through that to spread the gospel. That's called faith. Yes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us, for the time that you allow us to abound, that you give us many blessings, Father, and that you allow us to live a good life here in this country. Father, we pray that you would uh, remind us of your goodness, that you would remind us of uh, your goodness during times when things are not going well, that you would give us the grace and the faith to remember that you are working through us and that these sacrifices that you've called upon us to make, Father, are sacrifices that will result and the spread of your gospel, and that are being used for your honor and your glory, Father. Father, we ask you to be with us as we go forward from here now, that you would be a strength and a comfort and encouragement to all of us. And, Father, we pray that you would empower us to uh, carry out the gospel this week. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand. We'll have a hymn of invitation. <laughs>